martes coloquial. En esta ocasión eh, tenemos un invitado de la Escuela Politécnica de Montreal, que es el profesor Michel Meunier. Y eh, voy a dar eh, lectura a su semblanza curricular. Eh, el profesor Meunier es graduado de la Escuela Politécnica de Montreal, donde obtuvo el eh, grado de licenciatura y maestría en Ingeniería Física, 1978 y 1980 respectivamente. Posteriormente, en 1984, obtuvo el doctorado en Ciencia de Materiales en el, Instituto Poli en, el, en el Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts. En 1985, inició su carrera como profesor en la Escuela Politécnica de Montreal y posteriormente, en 1993, fue, fue promovido a la categoría de profesor titular. Eh, ha obtenido varios reconocimientos, entre ellos el Synergy Award Innovation, entregado por el INSERT, que es el, el homólogo al CONACYT aquí en México, eh, es eh, fellow de varias asociaciones, la Academia eh, Canadiense de Ingeniería, así como de la OSA, y actualmente también es fellow de la, de la SPIA. Eh, ha tenido una intensa actividad en las áreas de nanomateriales, nuevos nanomateriales ópticos, dispositivos nanópticos y tecnología láser para aplicaciones en nanomedicina. Ha publicado más de 380 artículos y supervisado a más de 120 estudiantes en los niveles de maestría y doctorado, así como eh, becarios postdoctorales. Desde el, primer, desde el primero de junio de 2019, él es el jefe del Departamento de Ingeniería Física de la Escuela Politécnica de Montreal. Eh, le damos la cordial bienvenida al profesor. Miguel. So, thank you for the kind invitation and for invi inviting me to the uh, to the university and uh, thanks again again for for the invitation what I'm going to talk about is application of nanophotonics and intrafast laser to biomedical and uh, these are some hot topics that we are developing at the Polytechnic in my lab for many years and uh, I'd like to give uh, some sort of halfway lecture and at the same time also some results that we are developing in the last many years. Just to tell you where I come from, uh, this is Mexico and I think that we are just at the center here if I, if I did it correctly here. And uh, I don't know if this will be working correctly here. <laughs> So, so we're going to Montreal in Canada. Montreal is an island. And at the center of this island, there is a small mountain called Mont Royal. And on this, there is a two university. On one side, the English University, Mayhill, and the other side, University of Montreal. And Polytechnic is part of the uh, of University of Montreal. And, and, uh, and uh, basically, this is the campus of the university, so Polytechnic is this, these buildings here, essentially. This is all engineering, it's all engineering, there is, no, there is no other aspects, while in the university here and some many other buildings, they are all others, uh, other faculties. It's not that big like UNAM, uh, I just heard it was 300,000 students here. Uh, we're around 60 or 70,000 students, but Polytechnic is much less than that. Basically, 8,000 students, all in engineering, and uh, we have 1,600 graduates per year, 260 professors, and almost 150 years of history, and almost 40,000 graduates over all the, all the years. We're in the top three of engineering in, uh, in Canada, and uh, the first one in Quebec. In Quebec is French speaking, as you probably know. And uh, actually, sometimes we say we are the first one in general, French speaking engineering faculty in art, North America. <laughs> Maybe America completely. So, so, so that's the way of presenting things. But uh, this is a French speaking uh, <coughs> university. 8,600 students, 5,000 as a engineering, fa uh, engineering level, and 9%, uh, roughly 800 uh, PhD students in all the fields of, of uh, engineering. 
uh, as you see here, we cover all the engineering uh, aspects and uh, as basically I am affiliated with physics and also uh, biomedical. I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of engineering physics now, but I am affiliated with the approach with the uh, development of biomedical application, as you will see during this, uh, this presentation. So this is a picture of my group here. So there is one part that is missing here at the, at the top. But, uh, okay, so it's laser processing and plasma leak laboratory. So essentially, we develop laser processes, so based on mostly ultra-fast lasers, and also plasmonic, and I'm going to tell you what is plasmonics and go a little bit more on this aspect in the, during this talk here. Um, so we develop and model ultra-fast laser processes, nanomaterials for biomedical, bio-nanoplasmonic devices, and develop nanotherapy and nanodiagnostics. And what I'm going to talk about essentially here, it will be the, the nanotherapy and also a little bit the, uh, on the nanodiagnostics. So we have an infrastructure that is close to $5 million of uh, lasers and uh, various optical setup and various systems that include plasmonic systems, uh, various ultra-fast lasers, and, and also uh, cell culture, and also <coughs> right now we're starting to have an in vivo facility <coughs> In, in our lab, as well as in collaboration with medical doctor and hospital. So that's the way of developing the, this, uh, this research. So basically, we cover all the various aspects from the fundamentals aspect to the engineering and to the application in the field of biomedical. Fundamental aspects cover the physics of plasmatic nanostructure, imaging plasmatic nanostructure nanoparticles, the physics of intrafast laser interactions with plasma nanostructure as well as various types of materials. On the engineering side is to build devices, to build nanomaterials, to build optical imaging system. I'm going to cover a little bit more briefly the laser nanosurgery that we are that we are developing for a number of years now. And to perform drug delivery. This is something that uh, that we have a pattern that we've been developing for a number of years now. And in the application in the field of medicine is the application mostly in ophthalmology and in pathology that uh, this is what we are, this is what we are doing. So basically the title is Biomedical Application of Nanophotonic and Ultrafast Laser and I'm going to cover two topics. The, the first one will, will probably last two thirds of the time and the last one, one third, roughly. And uh, to cover plasmonic nanoparticles and then ultrafast laser nanosurgery. And it's to perform <coughs> nanosurgery in living cells. And they're still living at the end. So the idea is to be able to perform that with a, with an ultrafast laser. And, and use this type of nanoparticle as well to, uh, to elaborate uh, to elaborate the uh, bioimaging approach, so for pathologists. So let's start with the first topic. <coughs> Plasma nanoparticle and answer to fast laser nanosurgery. And I'm going to, I, I like history. So I will start with an approach that is based on the history. The history of scalpel, the history of making surgery with a scalpel. Basically the scalpel has been used for many tens of thousands of years at the beginning and then middle age this is what it was used and uh, more recently in the 20th century of course I mean this is being used by medical doctors for many many uh, many decades. The scalpel has some limitation of course as you probably know I mean this this precision is limited by the blind angle. So can we do better? It's the use of a laser. You can use a laser to perform surgery. Surgery at many levels, mostly in ophthalmology, but also in cutting various, various parts in determining surgery by medical doctors. And uh, so these are some, some uh, examples. 
Of course, when you focus a laser, as you, as you know, if you're optical, if you're expert in optics, you're limited by the, the wavelength. As you focus, roughly, the laser beam is focused on a wavelength region. Okay. However, when there is an absorption into a material, the energy dissipates, and then this, this cutting <coughs> is usually much larger than the wavelength. Because as you focus the laser, this will expand the energy to the material into all the various pieces of whatever the material is. And, and then you get some kind of transformation, ablation in a much larger region. Can we do better? The great surgeon of the future would be a nanosurgeon. This is the book. Uh, I think it's only available in French, but probably it would be translated in some other languages someday. But basically, uh, I like this book because it requires all the history related to the, uh, to the surgery. And uh, performing nanosurgery. Performing nanosurgery in cells so that you can do specifically some kind of transformation, very local. <coughs> That's why we can use ultrafast laser. Ultrafast laser has the, the advantage of limiting the energy diffusion because to perform the surgery, you need less energy. So less energy that is dissipated, so less energy that will, be, that will affect the surrounding region where you do the surgery or you do the, the various uh, ablation, whatever. So you limit the heat effect to its own. And you have also a lot of nonlinear phenomena <coughs> that I'm going to show you in, in a few minutes. So this is a typical ultra-fast laser that you can uh, buy on, on the market. This is a quite an old one. Uh, I have another one also that is a new. new. Uh, this is from a, so a laser like this, as you probably know, I mean, it's not something that you have I mean, a little box. I mean, you have a lot of mirrors and different parts that, uh, that gives you the, the, the pulse at the end, which is, in this case, around 100 femtosecond. I have another one at 45 femtosecond. So this is a very old picture from uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Chichikov, here, uh, published uh, almost 25 years ago now basically showing that if one takes a piece of uh, material here, it's a piece of steel here, and you use a nanosecond compared to a femtosecond, and as you see here, I mean, there is a lot of heat. The heat affected zone is pretty large compared to here. And you can do very fine ablation with a, a ultrafast laser. So this has been around for many, many years, and uh, it's been used for performing uh, laser ablation uh, with various types of materials and so on. With ultrafat, there are a lot of photons at the same time, so the fact of having a lot of photons at the same time can give rise to a multi-photon absorption. And this is pretty interesting. For application in the field of biomedical, the, the bio, biomedical environment, cells and tissues and so on, is mostly water. So basically, we can have multiple absorption that can give rise to the ablation or transformation. If one gets at the 800 nanometer about a nanosecond from, a, let's say, a valence band to conduction band, uh, you get something that will not be uh, very well absorbed, depending on the, the at, at this wavelength, it is uh, pretty pretty low absorption, actually. However, <coughs> if you arrive with a femtosecond laser, a femtosecond laser that a lot of photons at the same time, you can go through virtual states and basically arrive with here with a multi-photon absorption. This can give rise to a phenomena of being able to focus the beam much more uh, in much more, much more uh, um, um, the focus can be uh, much finer. Let's see if I have here, this is the beam focus at one point, and this is the intensity, which is roughly a Gaussian, something like that, and you will have a heat affected zone, I mean, a treatment zone that is that size. But if it is two photons, this would be this curve to the square. And if it is three photons, if it is 
four, four photons and so on. So basically you can have a very fine, uh, uh, due to multi-photon absorption, a very fine ablation region. So, so this is something that was used by some of my colleagues that I know, Eric Mazur, for instance, at Harvard, <coughs> that I know that uh, did that. This is pretty old, 2006. That you can cut different pieces in the uh, in the, in a cell, let's say, or even cut a, a DNA here uh, strand uh, with an uh, with a in a, a range of hundreds of nanometer, maybe a little bit larger. Can we do better? If the answer was no, I mean, the talk will stop here, so I have another solution. We can use femtosecond laser in nanotechnology. We're going to couple these two here, and uh, actually, as I'm going to present in a few minutes, that startup lies like, like a, a lab curiosity. And, uh, and, uh, and I was not doing bio at that time. And then, after a certain time, we say, if we can do bio with that, and uh, do essentially a surgery on a nanoscale. This can be interesting. So no, not only that we can do better, but we will do more. We will do something more. We will do much more than that, uh, than, than just doing a nanosurgery. We're going to do some aspect that biologists are looking for. Gene therapy, delivery of drugs, and so on, by performing this. And this is what I'm going to show you. For that, I'm going to talk about plasmonic nanoparticles. Plasmonics are, yeah, I brought some here. The uh, plasmons are collective free excitation in, in a metal. Basically, it's not the electrons alone, it's the collective excitation that upon the irradiation, they will just oscillate, but oscillate in a way in the nanomaterial so that it is confined by the nanomaterials or nanosphere or whatever and in this case it will have some resonance and some properties that will depend on the, the, the dimension. This is the basis of nanophotonics with, with plasmonics here. And this is the, the, uh, the optical absorption of this, uh, of this nanomaterial if you add, let's say, 100 nanometer gold particle, these are gold, by the way, okay? And uh, it is red because of this curve here that I'm going to explain uh, in, the, in a minute here. So you have here a scattering curve and an absorption curve here. And as you see, the absorption and scattering is pretty large in the five, 50, 600, and something like that. So this is the visible. So this particle absorbs quite a lot in the visible. However, in the red here, the absorption is very small. And that's the reason why these nanoparticles in the solution here looks red. It's because of that phenomena. So this plasmonic phenomena here. So the idea now is, can we use this here to, to perform a, a nanosurgery. Okay, so the idea is to use the concentration of the near field close to the particle. So this is, this is the field distribution upon an irradiation at 800 nanometer close to the particle, gold particle. And as you see, the field distribution is pretty high here. The polarization is horizontal in this case here. The field, the, the field is much higher, let's see around five, let's say, here. And, and, and as you know, I mean, the energy is, is E squared, so it's five squared. So basically, there's 25, more, 25 times more energy close to the particle here compared to, to there. So it concentrates the energy at one point, at the two points in this case, because the polarization is, is uh, horizontal. If the polarization was circular, it would be distributed. But again, there would be a region where this field is, is, is uh, amplified. So basically, this film, this film amplification can be used to induce a highly localized process on a nanoscale. So I'm going to use that like a nano lens. It's a nano lensing effect to concentrate the energy at a specific point. 
This is one example. This is a nano run, but the uh, example is, is not important. The idea here is that we use a, a, nano, a nano particle that is on a substrate. So let's say this is a nanoparticle. Usually I'm using a, an apple, and I forgot to bring an apple this morning. <laughs> this, uh, the, the, so, you, so, so if I have here, and I, and I put on the silicon substrate this nanoparticle there, and I irradiate, at some point, nothing will happen here because the influence of the energy, the, the, the energy of the laser is low. Except where the nanoparticle is, there will be a field amplification, and due to the field amplification of five, 25 more energy at one point compared to the rest, we can create an ablation close to the particle. So that's the idea, and then that when we started that 10 years ago, we say, oh, this is interesting, I can perform nanoablation, okay? And so I can put nanoparticles at different places, okay? So this is random, actually. And then shining the laser can make nano hole. Okay, that's interesting. I'm not, no, I'm not sure how to use that for silicon or for different types of materials, but let's switch the substrate. Instead of having a substrate like a silicon, let's put a biological media. Now, so instead of having a, uh, a silicon, a piece of silicon, I, if I can use a cell. And at that time, I mean, I'm a physicist, so I mean, in biology was pretty far from uh, my knowledge, but anyway, I was collaborating with people that knew how to handle that and tried to understand how, how to handle uh, cells and so on. So the idea was to have a cell and then we put a nanoparticle there. And by performing an irradiation, I can perform a, a nanosurgery now. And a surgery on a nanoscale in, on, the, on the cells. So application to biology, the idea is we can perform not only a nanoscalpel, but a multi-nanoscalpel. So the idea is the following. We use a ultra-fast laser at 800 nanometer. And this is well known in the field of uh, biophotony. There is a weekly absorbing window around, let's say, 800 nanometer. So this is 800 nanometer. So basically, at 800 nanometer, the absorber <coughs> is pretty slow. So we can have a very low fluence that is barely affecting the cells or the tissue. It's not like in the visible, the visible, the absorption. This is on a log scale, so there's a factor of 100 here. So basically, I mean, the optical penetration depth with the, in the visible is very small. But actually, in the, usually in the red, yeah, you see in the red, it goes to my, uh, my uh, uh, finger here. And of course, this is not 800. At 800 nanometer, it can penetrate quite deep. So essentially, is to use 800 nanometer, which is barely absorbent. And now, what I do is that if I can put different nanoparticles in different places, I can produce a nano surgery. So that's the idea. <coughs> if I use a conventional laser, I will produce a hole that is basically a little bit larger than the wavelength, and probably larger than the wavelength. So. Instead of that, if I put one nanoparticles in, the, in cells here, these are nuclei, by the way, so this is the cell, and uh, irradiate this, I can perform here a, a highly localized uh, surgery on a nanoscale. The idea now is that if I can functionalize nanoparticles, now this is something that biochemists are pretty good. We're developing that technology in these recipients and so on. Basically, I'm not a biochemist, but in this project, I need biochemists that really put on the nanoparticles some biomolecule that will recognize different parts of the cells or tissues. So basically, it's like, it is like a seeking device. This nanomaterial here can be bounded at a specific place of the cells. And this is a technology that's been developed for many years by biochemists and also by uh, biologists. So basically the idea is that I can, let's say I want to 
target these specific cells, I can put many types, many scalpel all at once here. So basically, if I have all these nanoparticles there, I can do an irradiation that is not focused. Irradiation doesn't need to be focused, I just want to irradiate quite large. The nanoparticle is acting like a nano lens, it's lensing on a fine scale. And in this case, I can produce a, let's say, an ablation of the membrane. So a cell is, per, is as a membrane, and the idea is to perforate the membrane so that we can start doing things inside. And this is the application. I'm a physicist, so I started to look some years ago to the, uh, to the physics about what is going on. It's an interesting problem from the physics point of view because it involves ultra-fast laser on a femtosecond time scale and a nanometer range scale. <coughs> this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon that is uh, arriving and I can pass a few minutes on this page just to show you some of the various phenomena that can happen into, into, the, into the nanoparticles. So we develop all the physics on that and also the application. Basically, you can have some kind of, of heating of the particle because there may be some kind of little absorption. This can give rise to the heating of the surrounding, and surrounding is mostly water in this case, so there would be some kind of uh, heat transfer. But this will take some time because the pulse width is 45 femtoseconds. So during this time, there is a lot of phenomena happening in the nanomaterial, but it is has to diffuse away. And, and the energy is then transferred to the, to the, to the, to the gas of electrons around the, uh, around the nanomaterial, and this leads to <coughs> highly excited electrons directly in the water due to the near field. And then there would be energy transfer to heat up the water in a, very, in a let's say, in a picosecond to nanosecond time frame. And then the energy release will give you a pressure wave. So a wave that starts from the nanoparticles and go away from the nanoparticles. So, so the idea is, is uh, this pressure wave can be quite interesting. It's a very high pressure wave, actually, that goes to the speed of sound. And then the phase transformation can give rise to a bubble, a bubble that is, on a, again, on a nanometer scale that will start to grow and to, and to collapse. So this was published uh, many years ago in Nano Letters. So basically, this nanoparticle is acting like a, a nano lens. And in a more representative way, sometimes I say, these nanomaterials can be like a nano heater, so a, a, a heater that is highly confined, producing a nanoplasma because they are highly excited by electron close to the particle. Uh, I call that a nano tsunami, so it's a, it's, it's a pressure wave, but in liquid, but in nanometer scale. So it's like a tsunami, it's a slow one pressure wave, and a nano bubble. So, uh, so these are the terms that sometimes I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm using. So this is the model for, for some that likes really multi-physics uh, multi uh, simulation and so on. My, my student, uh, Etienne Boulet, uh, uh, did his PhD I mean, many years ago and uh, basically was able to couple electromag. This is what is going on into the material plasma dynamics and water dynamics, which is basically the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, it took him four years to couple that, uh, but at the end he, he got the, the, the prize of the best thesis of the university. Uh, he, he, he realized something that was pretty, pretty difficult, I think. But anyway, I'm not going to go through that, just to tell you some of the results, uh, all of that, but in a very highly schematic way, actually. During the pulse, this is the log scale here, 10, 100, 1 picosecond, 10 picosecond, and 10 nanosecond here. Uh, so there is a field <coughs> amplification close to the particle. 
this field amplification generates plasma around the particle. This is at roughly 100 femtosecond, but that generates a little plasma close to the particle <coughs> that is that is expanding. And then there is a fast relaxation give rise to a strong pressure wave. The pressure wave starts in this range and then produces another nano, nano bubble. So basically, this is the, the physics about what is going on. I'm talking about nanobubbles since the beginning. So this is a pump probe experiments where we show that we can measure the, the, the bubble. So we shine uh, here the femtosecond laser and then we wait a few nanoseconds and uh, make a flash so that we can uh, take uh, the picture and then we put all the pictures together. And uh, basically what we see is that there is a uh, there is a bubble dynamics that we have modeled and so on. I'm not going to go through details about that, but basically this is the reality of this, uh, of this bubble. Now you will tell me if, if I put nanoparticles on the membrane, the bubble is a few tens of nanoseconds. The, this double layer of membrane is perturbed during nanosecond, but then it is perturbed during a much longer time because it's like a polymer that it will be disturbed and then try to rearrange. And actually, this is many seconds or even minutes that is perturbed so that we can have some kind of transfer to the, to the membrane. So this is the application that I'm going to, to explain. Particles are not broken. Why they are not broken? This is very important because uh, we don't want to have the particles that breaks. Um, the idea is that we irradiate at 800 nanometer. At 800 nanometer, this is the curve of absorption. Absorption is very small here. So there is very low absorption into the, into the particle. But actually, this near field leads to the plasma generation and cavitation. So basically, this, this is where it starts. So it's not an absorption phenomena. It is mostly based on this neophile amplification that leads to the generation of plasma and, and cavitation. So, nanoparticle acts as a nano lens. There is neophile, plasma generation, and a bubble, and the idea is like a nano lens. So, if you did not follow everything that I've discussed, just think about this nanoparticle when it is in one place, it's just concentrating energy. Okay, there's a lot of physics, interesting physics, but basically this is what, what we are doing here. So basically now, what can we do with this in terms of, uh, of uh, application? So there are potential sources for nanosurgery. Either it is heating phenomena that can destroy cancer cells or something like that. It can produce nanoplasma that can break chemical bound extra charges, highly localized chemical damage to biomolecule, highly localized mechanical damage like this nano tsunami, or maybe as a contrast agent in uh, photoacoustic imaging, and bubble generation. And the application I'm going to talk about now is this nano bubble here. I'm going to to switch to really biomedical now. Uh, I, I, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a, a medical doctor, of course. Uh, but I collaborate with people that can tell me what I what I can do with this. And uh, so the first thing was to to say, if, if if I'm perforating membranes of cells, what can I do? So I talk with biologists, and they say you can do what it's called. Uh, a, a transfection. So it's to include in the cell some other types of genes or biomolecule because you're perforating the membrane without killing the cell. This is very important. So that's the, the main idea. Transfection is the following here. Transfection is done either by conventional means like liposome or they use viruses. They use viruses, they empty the virus, and then they put what they want in it. This, these are the, the, the job of the biologist. Or more on the physics side, they use an electrical shock. Okay, so they, they put 
you know, shock. They, 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 they put like electrodes and increase the potential and put all that and then perform it with laser. And my technique is in this field, but however, I can do this in a very specific way as I'm going to mention. So what is transfection? Is to include strong DNA into the cell. We need to perforate the membrane. This is called transfection. So in this little movie of optoporation, so we have these uh, nanoparticles, <laughs> let's say gold nanoparticle in this case, that is going to do, this is not snow, uh, this is in Montreal we have a lot of snow, but this is not, uh, it is our nanoparticles arriving on the surface here. And, uh, and uh, basically uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have all the particles arriving on the, on the cell and then one shot, of the laser and then we're perforating the membrane and after a certain time the the uh, the other uh, molecules that were outside are going inside okay uh, that takes some time and so on but basically this is what we have uh, shown a uh, little while ago so at the beginning what we do we do the, we do in vitro so we have cells in vitro which means in like uh, on a piece of glass and uh, basically, you scan the laser on the top here, and uh, basically when it is green, it means that the green fluorophore is inside the cell. And basically, here, there was, there was no laser, here there was this laser, and, and then after all this, we showed that we, are, we were successful. <coughs> this is a publication in 2012. Okay, that was cited uh, hundreds of times uh, since the 2012. We can do, uh, this is a little bit more specific, but I think that's not really important to look at that. Maybe that we can do selective optoporation of targeted <coughs> viable cells without affecting the non-targeted cells. This is the conclusion of that. Uh, without going into too much detail, this is more biology, but it, it, it took us two years to obtain that figure. So, but, but basically, we can do here laser, but here only the green are affected and the red are not affected. And this is a real advantage of the, of the technique, is to be able to target specific cells and not other cells. What can we do with that? One idea I had a long time ago is to stimulate neurons. So, so this is for neuroscientists, it's to be able to now to have on a neuron network uh, in vitro, this is in vitro, Probably in vivo would be more complicated, but in vitro. You put nanoparticles, and then if I irradiate here, I can stimulate the contact between neurons. So it can act as a as a tool to make contacts between neurons. So so it's it's a tool for <coughs> neuroscientists, and this is what we have shown here. So we use a near infrared laser, femtosecond laser, to target specific biological sites. And we can stimulate on nanometer scale, and this is pretty important and interesting in terms of application. And then we can perform something specific as a nanometer, nano tsunami, nano bubble around that, around that. And uh, without going into much detail on that, here the uh, the the idea is uh, this is one example. It when it becomes after the shot, when it becomes green or greener, it means that there is an action potential that was connected between neurons. So we are acting like electrodes, but there are no electrodes here. It's basically where the nanoparticles are and with the laser that can stimulate the different parts of the neural <coughs> network. A neural network as a physicist is like a, a big complicated uh, RL, RLC uh, circuit that you can play with the various uh, various components. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> we can do optoporation also in, in the living uh, animals. The idea I had at the beginning was, how can I do that in vivo? Where can I shine the laser in vivo? And the obvious one was in the eye. And ophthalmologists are using laser in the eye for many decades now. So this is not new. 
So they perform different types of surgery. So this is not new. And the other thing is we have to inject nanoparticle. You say, oh, well, how can you inject this? I can tell you this is done regularly in the injection. My wife has a, has a problem with the eyes. She has an injection every month, actually. And uh, it's not pleasant, but this is something that is done by ophthalmologists. So the idea is the following here is, uh, is to, use, to use that for delivering drugs and, and try to, to investigate uh, various type of illnesses into the, into the eye. I, I put a provisional patent on that because we are, we, we are essentially the most advanced in the, with this technique in, in the world. So basically, ocular diseases affect millions of individuals worldwide. These diseases are either incurable or only transiently improved with current therapy. And we develop a high throughput, non-viral, so no viruses, gene delivery treatment. So basically, we use laser and nanoparticles. There are no viruses. And the, the idea is to deliver what is called a small interfering RNA into the retina cells in this example. Uh, ret uh, small interfering RNA means that if you have the retina that is uh, ill function, by doing that, you can rearrange the uh, reprogram the, 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 the cell so that it, is, it works better. So the idea is to address here age-related macular degeneration. So this project is uh, well funded right now, uh, three quarter of a million that I have for developing this right now. Uh, but ba basically, uh, we work with ophthalmologists and biologists, and uh, for developing for developing this. So we work with living animals. So, so some people, if they don't want to work with living animals, they are not allowed to, to work on this part of the project because, I mean, we sacrifice the animal at the end and so on, so I mean, it's something that you have to get used to it. Okay, so there is a double targeting with nanoparticles and laser irradiation. Basically here we show that nanoparticles are directly in the, on the retina cell, without going into much detail, this is not important. This is the... Um, the titanium sapphire, uh, this, this is one of the systems that we use at that time. We're using other types of laser right now, uh, femtosecond laser. And basically, this is the example from the retina in vivo. You take it out and you look, and when it is red, it means it is successful. That's basically that, because of this side five here that is red upon the fluorescence here. So it works, and we're very happy about that. And the last thing that I check before putting the patent, uh, provisional patent, is to see if the process is toxic here. And basically, injection is non-toxic. Irradiation with nanoparticle is non-toxic. This is what it shows that. So basically, it's non-toxic. It is working. And that's why we are pursuing in the, on, this, on, this, uh, on this project. So we have demonstrated this nanosurgery approach, apply this to neurons, to in vivo target with, uh, with this, these biomolecules. Laser in ophthalmology is mostly used for cutting today in many ophthalmology uh, uh, clinic here. And uh, I think that in the future that we have probably laser for therapy. I know it's a very long way to go. It's a very long journey, actually. I started that almost 10 years ago, and I know that I have for many, many other years. I know that doing therapy in medical, it's a long process. Uh, we have uh, more than 14 papers and patents specifically on that, on the physics and application and so on. And, uh, you can look up at the, my website. My second topic, not sure, maybe 10 minutes for that here, is to use these nanoparticles for bioimaging. So in, in the lab, I do therapy, but I do also diagnostic. Diagnostics, the journey is a little bit shorter. So I can use this technology to perform uh, diagnostics. A diagnostics can be much closer to the application compared to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the therapy. So I brought 
this is silver nanoparticles. It looks like uh, water, but uh, it has uh, different colors depending on the, the way that it is irradiated. So it is this color and this color. And as you see, the plasma on peak here is much larger. It's at 400 nanometer, and the goal is around 520 or 530, depending on the size. This is a 30 nanometer <coughs> particles. So this splitting arrangement between the two, and actually, what we were able to develop is, is a technique to fabricate these nanoparticles, to fabricate nanoparticles of different colors. This is, we follow a certain kind of recipe for, for that, but we improve it so that we can fabricate any size and any composition. This was not done in the literature, by the way. So we have this pattern that was just accepted last year, and actually it is a process that lasts, I don't know, four or five years. Uh, so what can we do with this? It's a tunable spectra by changing the composition. So the idea is the following. Here, if we can functionalize the particle, and I'm not going to go through all that, I mean, these are standard recipes that you can put on the nanomaterial some kind of targets here that will go on the cells and target specific cancer cells or, or um, not cancer cell and so on. And then from the different colors that is there is to try to identify which one is which one here. So basically, that's the idea. Nanoparticles of different colors, functionalized, <coughs> put on the cells, and then have a visualization system so that we can see the various colors there. This is one example here with various colors on one cell. And uh, basically is to develop the, the optical setup so that we can see the particle and then identify the particle. This is what we call EPS spectral. EPS spectral imaging. EPS spectral imaging is X, Y, Z, lambda. So it's four dimension. So you can collect a lot of data with that. So the idea is to use that. So depending on the illumination, you can see here, I mean, this color or this color or this color, and then try to identify. So I'm working with pathologists uh, with, uh, with that. <coughs> So this is the system that we have developed and that we can identify on these pictures here, the various colors, and uh, I'm not going to go through that here. And this is one example in the X, Y, Z, and lambda. So this is three dimension plus, uh, plus wavelength. So there are four dimensions here to try to identify. So uh, the time scale is pretty important here. I'm going to skip that and uh, talk to you about uh, a company, a spin-off company that we started on that. So basically, the, this, this, this company uh, is, uh, is active in the lab and developing systems for, for that. It, essentially, we develop imaging and detection technology based on plasmatic optical properties of the colloidal particle. And basically, we can fabricate nanoparticles as well as different types of uh, nanosystem and, uh, and I'm not going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about this, this one here. So the ends that you see here, this is Jennifer, by the way, so we have some people that know Jennifer, that she, she liked to do, uh, did I do that? We're not going to see her on that <laughs> here, but, see, uh, but uh, she, so she, she used that quite uh, heavily in, uh, to, to see where the nanoparticles uh, nanoparticles are. So basically, depending on the way that we irradiate with uh, red, blue, green, lead, that we can see all the particles. And depending on if it is only the, the blue one or the, the, I mean, the blue one or the green one, that we can see only some of these particles. This is a very simple device, actually, that uh, we, we use conventional uh, red, blue, green, uh, uh, um, uh, red, green, blue, yeah, RGB uh, uh, laser, actually. So this is a conventional system here. And this is dark field that you usually, all biologists are using. 
And this is our system, exactly the same place. Exactly, it's just our illumination, so that the way of doing the illumination is different. And as you see here, and I mean, we see the particle, you see, we barely see the particles, you see, we see the particles. And here, we even see different types of particles that we even don't see here. So this is pretty, pretty uh, efficient. It's a cost-effective side illumination. So this is one example uh, of, uh, it, it looks like a, a, a galaxy that is very far and so on and with some stars, but actually, I mean, they are cancer cells on which we put gold and the particle of, the, of, of this ear. Okay, uh, this is a, a, a cancer uh, agglomerate, cancer uh, target. This is a cancer actually that is uh, in the eye of children. Uh, it's called the retinoblastome. And then we, we did, the DRE was to put nanoparticles into this cluster of cancer and then try to, to see if they are well distributed. Actually, we want to kill the cancer, so we did that also. But by just elimination, we killed everything. We killed all that. So this is uh, detecting four types of particles. Uh, you, you, you see here, I mean, uh, they are located on the specific cells here. And uh, so, so this is uh, one example of, uh, of these types of cells that can be targeted and then identified. So we have, again, plenty of uh, papers on that, that uh, we have, they are not the same than previous. These are other, other papers. I think it's time for me to conclude. I see the, the time is almost, almost, almost done. In, in summary, the, uh, I'm doing nanophotonics and ultrafast laser as a, as a physicist, but the idea is to develop that in a specific field. My idea at the beginning was to get grants, because it's easier to get grants when I say I'm going to solve a cancer problem, I'm going to solve a, I don't know, specific problems for biology, whatever, in the field of medical. This is easier to get money than just to say I'm going to develop a laser. Uh, that's, uh, that's basically uh, basically that. Uh, we developed nanoparticles for 3D multiplex bioimaging for doing uh, EPR spectral application in biology, as well as we can target nanosurgery for <coughs> cell transfection, drug delivery, gene therapy, and so on. Uh, we do other things also in the lab, like detection of bacteria and uh, uh, curing cancer uh, in the eye of children. I did, not, I did not show that. I wanted to focus on two. To, to these two applications here. So this is a, a picture of, a, of, the, of the group. Uh, I'm looking for a good PhD student, and uh, by the way, I have one good PhD student. You probably recognize this lady here. Uh, that is uh, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is working on the project of using, of, of using this technique in ophthalmology. She started the project on the cornea with other people. She's not a biologist, as you probably know, uh, but she's handling the laser and all the various activities around that. So she's a PhD in biomedical uh, application, I and mean, with Gabriel as a as a co-supervisor and uh, in a, an, an ophthalmologist at the other co-supervisor. So pretty good graduate students like that. If there are others, I would be very glad of having the, the student in, the, in my group. It's very, uh, my group is very, it's like the United Nations. I mean, I have people from all over the world. So it's, uh, uh, I, I have, a, I have, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, a Mexican. I have uh, some people from, uh, from Greece. Uh, from uh, China and uh, from France, from Belgium, and uh, she's learning French. She's, she starts to be pretty good, actually. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm looking for a PhD student. So those who would like to work with laser, nano, nanoplasmonics, and biomedical, or to have a cool to tell uh, that may be interesting also. I mean, uh, I see that you're doing interesting work in the, with the use of laser. So they are complementary work that we can settle also. This is pretty, pretty interesting. So now, if I put my hat as a chair of the department now, uh, I'm the chair of the engineering physics, and uh, we will be looking for several tenor track openings in the field of advanced material, photonic optic laser. Of course, this is very general uh, application, like uh, quantum technology. Uh, laser technology, application in biomedical, application in energy, uh, in technology. 
So this is not announced yet. We will be going through all the various steps to be, to be announced. And uh, so we are progressing in that direction. So I would like to stop here. I think I'm almost close to the end. It was up to one o'clock. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, for listening, and I'm open for question, discussion, comments, and more. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk, and we have some minutes to for questions. Thank you for this. Uh, yeah, to talk nice loud. Okay, uh, in the case of nanosurgery and nanoheaters, uh, the special resolution of the process is given, the, for the, given by the size of the nanoparticles. So what could be the result of using nano, nano second pulses or pico second pulses instead of the second there, there, there are in. Uh, we've done it with nanosecond. Actually, this can be it can be okay. Picosecond as well. Uh, the idea is the physics is different. Uh, in one case, uh, with the femto, is the creation of this nanoplasma. If you look, if you, if you, uh, as I explained, the, uh, the 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 physics is slightly different than compared to a nanosecond. So if you use a nanosecond, yes, you can do it. The point is that you need to be in resonance. And in resonance, for with this type of nanoparticle, this is in the visible. And the biological media is, is uh, greatly absorbing. So there is a kind of trade-off between the two, which does not fit. You can still do at 800 nanometer. I mean, this, this choice, I mean, you, you have a very good question. I mean, that's your, you can change wavelength, you can change the particle, we can change the size, and all that. We arrive with this, this type of combination of laser and nanoparticle, which works quite well. We're, we're right now looking at picosecond laser uh, in some region that are of interest, and we change the nanoparticles. I did not publish that, but the, with the, so, so there's a lot of engineering to be done. <laughs> Nanosecond laser leads to heating. And, and you can do it, but there is more chance of killing particles, and killing the cells. That's the trade-off. So it depends on the cells also. If the cells are very sensitive, this technique is, is good. It's difficult, so it's a trade-off. I'm not saying that my technique is solving all the problems of the world, <laughs> of course, uh, but to, to say that we can uh, use that, yes. So you're right. I mean, all combinations are possible. I'm using that because I think it's the best. But, yeah. And have you tried? I'm sorry. So, sorry. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Have you tried these approaches with other kind of geometries? I mean, the nanoparticles as nano rods, for instance. Nano. Nano rods. Nano rods. Yeah. Good question. <coughs> Pretty good question. The first thing that we did in vitro was okay. I'm going to use nanoparticles, but I want to be in resonance. So why not using nano rods? With the nano rods, of course, I can shift to 800 nanometer and be exactly in resonance. The problem is that absorption is too large. And I'm destroying nano rods. And, uh, and it is not that e efficient. And uh, basically, we have developed, an, uh, we have developed a, uh, an approach like called a rational design so that we can look at the trade-off between resonance and outer resonance. You saw that I am off resonance. 800 nanometer compared to nanoparticle is at 500 something. I'm off resonance. You understand the term? Mm -hmm. Okay. And and actually, uh, through uh, through uh, optical design, we arrive with a nano shell that is that is uh, better than this, uh, but it's more complicated to fabricate. Gold nano gold nanoparticle is something I can fabricate and uh, very easily, or I can buy the Nano shells specifically, yes, I can buy them. They are less fragile also. Yes, you can use this. So complete resonance, no way. 
it's a little bit hard to resonance that I should do. That's a good question, and then we have a paper and then later on that. Yes? Uh, uh, for applying this techniques into cells or in precise points of tissues, do you need uh, micromechanics? Uh, what kind of micromechanics do you think is necessary? Or no, not? I, no, no, I don't use that. Uh, no, it's just uh, statistics. <laughs> we inject and it goes at different places. The idea now is, now it's more a question of the, this biochemistry and biology. So the idea is that nanomaterials that are functionalized can travel at different places and then there, there are various steps that it will be washed away. So particles are washed away, are no longer good. So basically those that are attached that are giving that. So now we, we don't control where it will attach. We control only on, this, on the types of biomolecules that will bound in a specific place on the, on the cells. So this is a biochemistry, so it's a click chemistry of some sort, that's not a click chemistry, it's um, uh, antibody uh, clicking onto the, onto the cell. So that's the way that it is determined. But there's, this is not precisely okay. controlled. I don't control it with a micro or nano mechanics, no. Some of my colleagues have done that with, I mean, with the laser that you can control the position of nanoparticles. But this would be at one, one nanoparticle at a time. I'm putting uh, uh, billions of nanoparticles at the same time. It's, uh, it's, it, it goes, this is more like statistics. Yeah. You mentioned you were going to use a dazzler. A uh, uh, what? A dazzler, ball shaping. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, when we discussed before, before the talk. Yeah, but uh, this is just for pulse compression or is for provide some particular phase to the pulses? produce some particular effect? We have not done it, so um, I can tell you the idea, maybe if you're successful that would be good. Uh, we, we have not done it yet. The, the idea is to be able to, to l l let's say, we understand the physics, so that we can produce a plasma and then interact with the plasma around the particle. So the idea was to play with the, uh, the overall interaction between producing a plasma and then interacting with the plasma. So, so the Dazzler can help for that. But this will be much more like a pump probe. The idea with the Dazzler is to be able to, to put the energy into the system in a more efficient way than just putting a lot of energy during 45 femtoseconds. That's the idea. So the, it's not to compress. While well, compressing will be interesting, we haven't done below 45 femto. It will be interesting to look at. Uh, maybe uh, you, I know you have facilities for 12, uh, 12 uh, femto. This would be interesting to see if well, we can produce something that is more specific. Yes. If you can do pump probe on this, on this here with your 12 femto. Yes, and see. Uh, and, uh, and see all what is the bubble dynamics and so on. It's a complicated setup that uh, we, we do have, but we don't have 12 femto, we have 45 femto and all the rest. Any other question? Okay, if not, well, I'd like to thank you for this nice talk and we have a gift for you. Ah, thank you. <laughs>